The history of Barnes & Noble is a fascinating one. As the largest book retailer in the U.S., it has 614 locations across all 50 states, each stocking hundreds of thousands of titles. So it's hard to imagine that such a company would have declined the way it had. But the story is far from over. From their rapid growth that turned them into the largest individual bookstore in the world, to massive layoffs, over 100 store closures, and scandals, to now the company's unexpected comeback, there's no doubt that Barnes & Noble has not only a rich history, but an incredible tale to tell. So how did this once failing company make its incredible comeback? Let's find out. To understand what happened to Barnes & Noble, we must understand its origins. Barnes & Noble traces its roots all the way back to 1886, when Harvard graduate Gilbert Clifford Noble was hired as a clerk at a New York City bookstore called Arthur Hines & Company. By 1894, Noble partnered with Hines and the shop's name was changed to Hines & Noble. Eventually, in 1917, Noble bought out Hines and partnered with William Barnes, the son of an old friend of Noble's, and the name of the business was then changed to Barnes & Noble. It's interesting that the old flagship Barnes & Noble in New York City once featured the motto, founded in 1873, and even the Barnes & Noble website states that their beginnings can be traced to that year. This comes from the fact that Charles Barnes, William's father, had started his own book printing business from home in 1873 in Wheaton, Illinois, before his son took off to New York to partner with Gilbert Noble to establish Barnes & Noble. Now, technically, the business that evolved from Charles Barnes' book printing business never really had any connection with Barnes & Noble, except for the fact that both were partially owned, at different times, by William Barnes. In 1930, Noble sold his share of the company to Barnes's son, John. In 1932, they moved their store to 18th Street and 5th Avenue, which served as the company's flagship location until its closure in 2014. By the 1940s, major change was on the way. First, there was a shift in inventory from academic and medical books to paperbacks. During World War II, paperbacks were fairly new and GIs became accustomed to carrying them rather than hardcover books. Barnes & Noble sought to accommodate them by changing their inventory as the soldiers returned to American shores. Second, they focused on the atmosphere a bit more, becoming one of the first stores to feature Muzak in 1940, and major renovations followed as well as additional locations in Brooklyn and Chicago. Quick expansion occurred in the 1950s and 60s, and by 1966, the conglomerate Amtel bought the company. Only two short years later, Leonard Riggio bought Barnes & Noble for $1.2 million, adopting its name for his expanding company he had founded in 1965, which was known as the Student Book Exchange. By the time he acquired Barnes & Noble, it had been mismanaged and consisted of only a significantly reduced wholesale operation and a single retail location, which was a flagship store at 105 Fifth Avenue. But Riggio had a vision, a bookstore with an in-store coffee shop. He implemented the concept along with the spacious reading alcoves to create an alluring atmosphere for readers. And by 1974, the sole Barnes & Noble store had 150,000 books and aired its first commercial. In the 1970s, Barnes & Noble opened smaller discount stores, but eventually phased them out in favor of larger stores. Expansion continued in the 80s, and in 1986, they bought the B. Dalton bookstore chain that consisted of 797 in-mall locations. It was argued that this gave them the blueprint to create what, in 1992, became the definitive bookselling superstore. Not only that, the acquisition turned Barnes & Noble into a nationwide retailer. A few years later, in 1993, Barnes & Noble became a publicly traded company under the ticker symbol BKS. From there, the company grew rapidly, with cookie-cutter stores with the same layout, furnishings, and books. This made the company scalable, and allowed them to grow rapidly with lower costs, driving independent bookstores to close their doors as they couldn't compete with the enormous title selection Barnes & Noble had, nor their prices. 1993 was also the year they housed the first Starbucks in a Springfield, New Jersey store, and from there, Starbucks cafes became a staple in all Barnes & Noble stores across the country. By 1995, sales were dipping in the B. Dalton stores, and so they began to close them with a new focus on Barnes & Noble superstores that consisted of large spaces with sometimes two or even three floors, all filled with books. Customers were in awe of the new mega bookstores. 
There was no doubt that the 90s was the golden decade, concluding with their flagship store in New York being added to the Guinness Book of World Records as the world's largest bookstore, with 150,000 books, 154,000 square feet, and almost 13 miles of shelving. By that time, Barnes & Noble had 483 superstores, 528 mall-based B. Daltons, and sales went up to $2.8 billion. They even began expanding into other markets, acquiring video game retailers with the purchase of Babbage Incorporated, the company that owned the GameStop name. They also eventually bought Funko, another video game retailer, as well as Game Informer magazine. By the end of the decade, Barnes & Noble was the second largest book chain, but a mortal threat was growing in cyberspace. In 1997, Barnes & Noble launched their website, a few years after Jeff Bezos had started his own bookselling business. That same year, Amazon.com went public, and this would mark the beginning of the decline for Barnes & Noble. By the late 90s, Barnes & Noble was running on all cylinders, but it seemed that Riggio noticed a competitor rising up ahead, and his fears were warranted. On May 12, 1997, they filed a lawsuit challenging Amazon's marketing claim as the world's largest bookstore. Interestingly, on the very same day the lawsuit was filed, Barnes & Noble launched its own e-commerce website. BarnesandNoble.com eventually went public as its own company in May 1999, which raised $450 million for Barnes & Noble as it squared off with Amazon. The website was jointly operated by Barnes & Noble and a German publishing company called Bertelsmann AG, with Riggio also serving as chairman of this new company. Amazon fired back in 2000, filing a patent infringement lawsuit against Barnes & Noble when the latter offered a one-click ordering option on its website called Express Lane. Eventually, the lawsuit was settled out of court, but the fight was far from over. It was clear that Barnes & Noble's plan was to compete directly with Amazon and other rivals with an online presence, such as Borders. But Barnes & Noble's competition had other plans. In 2001, Amazon partnered with Borders to sell more books online by helping them to relaunch Borders.com. Under the terms of the deal, Amazon would be the seller of record, providing inventory, fulfillment, site content, and customer service for the co-branded site, which also offered information about Borders store locations, as well as a calendar of in-store events. Then, in 2002, Leonard Riggio stepped down as CEO, naming his younger brother and former acting chief executive of BarnesandNoble.com, Stephen Riggio, to succeed him. By the following year, Barnes & Noble moved more aggressively into book publishing, something they had started in the 70s and 80s when they had reissued inexpensive versions of -of out-of-print titles. They acquired Sterling Publishing, and this new focus to expand the unit in 2003 led to the success of its book, Hippie, hitting the New York Times bestsellers list the following year. Then, in 2004, the company spun off GameStop in an attempt to simplify its corporate structure. It was also reported that year that reading was on the decline in America. The number of non-reading adults increased by 17 million between 1992 and 2002, but Barnes & Noble claimed that its retail store business was expanding in the book market. Yet, four years later, Barnes & Noble had closed some of its stores, including some of its superstores. And by early 2010, the last of the B. Dalton stores were scheduled to close, and Stephen Riggio stepped down as CEO, now naming William Lynch as new CEO of the company. Lynch focused on digital books for Barnes & Noble's future. He helped in launching Barnes & Noble's e-reader, The Nook. But this was two years after Amazon had already introduced the Kindle. Around this time, Borders had closed in 2011, marking Barnes & Noble as the last remaining national bookstore chain in the U.S. It wasn't long before Lynch resigned and was replaced by the chief financial officer, Michael Husby. But the company's revenue was on the decline. Barnes & Noble tried to make a comeback by expanding into music and movies, but this was just as the streaming wars were heating up. Now they weren't just competing with Amazon, but also Netflix and Apple. In 2014, they closed their original flagship store and announced it would separate its Nook Media division from its retail store division. Also during this time, a number of independent bookstores were beginning to pop back up, increasing by 35% in the past five years. Not only that, Amazon opened their first physical brick-and-mortar bookstore in Seattle with plans to open more. Their aim was to reach shoppers in more places and bring its online touch into the real world. 
The bookstores would pull from its vast data trove and showcase what people were reading, including the reviews they left on Amazon's website. That's when Hughesby departed and his role was filled in mid-2015 by Ronald Bohr, who then left one year later. He was replaced by Demos Parneros as new CEO. Parneros was in that role for 15 months before a scandal reared its ugly head, and he was abruptly fired for company policy violations and was immediately removed from the board. He then filed a lawsuit against Barnes & Noble for wrongful termination that led to the unspecified violation being revealed. Parneros strongly denied all claims against him. By 2018, Amazon accounted for almost half of the total of new book sales, about 48%. Meanwhile, Barnes & Noble's sales had fallen every year since 2012, from $7 billion to $3 billion. In February 2018, Barnes & Noble permanently laid off 1,800 full-time employees. Employee morale had also declined. Not to mention the company now had gone through four CEOs since 2010, sales had declined across the board, and the stock was down by 80%. Things were looking pretty grim for Barnes & Noble. By the end of the 2018 fiscal year that ended in July, the company's overall losses reached $17 million. Many concluded that Barnes & Noble would never recover. In August 2019, hedge fund Elliott Management Corp. from the UK acquired the chain for $683 million and took the company private. They had also recruited James Daunt to be CEO. Their pick for CEO was not random by any means. James Daunt had made a name for himself in the UK as the man who saved Waterstones. Daunt had started out at the age of 26, opening his own bookstore called Daunt Books in London. And in 25 years, he had expanded his company, opening six more locations. After that, in 2011, he became the managing director of Waterstones, a bookstore chain in the UK that is equivalent to Barnes & Noble in America. Waterstones was suffering the same fate as Barnes & Noble at the time but he had turned it around with great success in a matter of only a few short years. Now, it seems he's doing the same for Barnes & Noble. Since Daunt took the lead, Barnes & Noble had closed down 12 more shops permanently, but this was due to the events of 2020. But despite that, after those events, Barnes & Noble began seeing increased revenue for the first time since the early 2000s. They had also downsized many of the larger stores to locations less than half their size, a strategic move implemented by Daunt. This change was part of a bigger plan to take the company in a new direction. Though Daunt claims he didn't do much at all, the changes he made at Barnes & Noble had a big impact so far. He states that all he did was take away the corporate controls and did what he knows best, which was to run each Barnes & Noble location like an independent bookstore. This meant giving managers at each store more autonomy over which books to stock and what would be displayed in the front of the store. For example, Brooklyn has a very different demographic with different customers who have very different book interests than, say, Georgia. So Daunt did away with the cookie-cutter model that had once helped the chain grow. He also eliminated the store aisle layout, opting instead for a new maze-like setup with beautiful displays that are different in every store. Daunt said in an interview, We had to take away all of those corporate controls, and one of them was that we used to sell the space so that every single store had the exact same books in it because a publisher paid for them to be there. We had to take all of that away if we were going to allow the booksellers to do the job that they need to do themselves. In only a year, things really turned around, and today, Barnes & Noble plans on opening 30 new stores this year. And Amazon? Well, as of March 2022, they closed their brick-and-mortar bookstores, stating they see more promise in grocery. So what does this all mean for the battle between Barnes & Noble and Amazon? Well, what I find interesting about what Daunt did was that he didn't seem to care too much about what Amazon was doing. He didn't fall for the trap that Barnes & Noble had seemed to keep falling into, trying to compete in the online world. Instead, wittingly or unwittingly, Daunt gave people what Amazon couldn't, connection with the real world. He brought back the old atmosphere of a small independent bookstore, delivering what the community needs and wants, which can help build relationships with the customers. And he also brought back a world of leisure and the fun and exciting pastime of browsing physical books, which doesn't sound much different from what they were doing before introducing the superstores. But with this story, timing is everything. The dawning of the digital age brought much excitement. You were able to find any book you could imagine, books that may have not been in your local bookstore, and your purchases could be delivered directly to you. It was convenient, but once the dust settled, the excitement wore off, 
and a never-ending selection to choose from left people in a state of analysis paralysis. People began to crave not only personal interaction, but the experience of walking into a bookstore and seeing all the books displayed, picking them up and reading the backs, and the relaxed browsing experience such a bookstore offers. Amazon can't offer that experience online. No one can. But does that mean Amazon loses? Not likely. Amazon offers convenience for those who already know what they want or need. And they offer books at cheaper prices, since Amazon doesn't have the overhead that a physical bookstore has. And Barnes & Noble is for those who want to browse, sip coffee, chat, and be surrounded by books. Sure, Barnes & Noble is pricier, but you are paying for the experience as well. So, in the end, both Amazon and Barnes & Noble win. One dominates online, as the other focuses on the physical world. So, what do you think? Will Barnes & Noble thrive from here on out with their new strategy? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Also, if you have any requests for future topics, leave those in the comments as well. Thank you for watching.